Kudos, uh, we're coming in, I know, man, and in off for the Egan's video. Welcome to yet another exciting video, in this case, part 63 of my game system design series of videos. In this video, I'll be exploring Napoleonic rules, variable base widths, and using base widths as the measuring system within the rules. The topic of base widths in the figure gaming world, especially Napoleonic, is massive, and I've created an earlier video detailing the evolution of base widths. However, one area I have not covered is the use of base widths as a form of measuring distance and the impact of various variable base widths within a rules. Almost all rules prior to DBN used a ruler, either inches or centimetres, to measure all distances. Now, this was the seemingly most logical approach. However, when DBA, DBM and DBMM started using base widths as the primary form of measuring, the dominance of the system was broken. I have to admit, anyone who has converted a board game into a hexless figure gaming system would have gravitated to the concept of base width as a measuring system regardless, because those rules all use hexes as their primary form of regulating movement and direct fire. However, this was most certainly a fringe area of the hobby, at least until comparatively recently. After DBN introduced the idea to the mainstream Napoleonic figure gaming community, I started converting board games into a hexless figure gaming format and used the same system. I did not initially like the system when I was first introduced to it, particularly in the ancient world, but now I'm a big fan of it. It actually is easier. There are some rule scale where this system is not suitable, but for players who wish to reproduce entire battles, it was an easy fit and works very well. This system, that is using base widths as a measuring mechanism, can easily be retrofitted to any older set of rules if players so desire. The main benefit is the system is base width agnostic, thus players can have the same experience with 6mm figures of 2cm wide bases or 25mm figures on 6cm wide bases. There is no need to do any complex conversion or calculation, although you did need to be able to create the specific ruler marked off in base widths. There was one initial issue with this system, as initially, at least initially at least, this implied all bases need to be the same widths. Napoleonics in particular are fond of having different base widths for different troop types. WRG Wargame Rules 1685 to 1845 while is a good example, while it used the same base width for infantry and cavalry, it used a smaller base width for artillery. I'm not going to cover rules prior to 1979, but, the, but they generally had different base widths for different troop types. Let's go through some of the rules post or from 1979 to today. Let's start with the classic Napoleonic rules, which many UK-based gamers first played on a regular basis. The War Game Rules, 1685 to 1845, by Philip Barker. There were a few earlier editions in the WRG rules area, but this was the most common and popular set of rules used. Putting skirmishes and artillery to one side, all bases were similar in terms of width, which for 15mm was 3cm. Artillery was 2cm wide, which was done to allow each figure to represent two guns, allowing players to form batteries of 6 to 8 guns. In reality, the width of each two-gun section could be rather significant in terms of variability, uh, but this was what WRG at the time uh, did, and it seemed to make sense for WRG. The skirmishes were half, one and a half centimetre wide because they were actually half bases. This was done to avoid double basing figures, that is, players did not have to create a skirmish version and a line infantry version of their troops. Another favourite set of rules was Empire 3rd Edition, which I loved but was never actually able to ever learn the rules well enough to have a real game from beginning to end. I love the concepts, but the execution and the rules seem to be a bit lacking. Empire 3rd Edition used single element basing for the most part, which was rather old school by 1981. I have to admit the rules did encourage you to group them together, but the basic principle was single element basing. But even here you could see different base widths from 3 quarters of an inch to 3, two, three, three eighths of an inch per figure based on the troop type. Core Commander introduced what I call the standard US basing system for Napoleonics. 
And it's certainly an underrated set of rules, especially in terms of historical impact, which I think is quite significant. This basing system used the three quarter inch wide by one inch deep for infantry or for metric two centimetres wide by three centimetres deep. For cavalry and artillery, the width was one inch wide or three centimetres if metric. It used variable weight base widths. You cannot underestimate the impact of this set of rules, Napoleon of Battles. These rules heralded in the age of reproducing entire battles they may not have been the really biggest battles, you know, such as Borodino or Leipzig, but something like Marengo could easily be refought in a reasonable period of time and on a reasonably sized playing area with these rules. These rules used a similar basing system to the earlier Corps Commander, with the only unusual aspect being the double depth cavalry element. Uh, this double depth cavalry never really caught on, but the um, the rest has certainly become a form of standard basing for the US. These rules are also rather underrated, I suspect because most people use them for the more traditional scale rather than the optional higher battle scale, which I particularly liked. Charco is unusual as being a US set of rules, it did use a UK basing system. All bases in this case were the same, except skirmishes, which used a double width base. And there was no reason why you could not use standard widths for the skirmishes, with two per base, and place two together to achieve the same objective that um, Shaco demanded. And that certainly was something that many UK players did. These rules are freeware rules from Australia, which are surprisingly complete and detailed, but like many freeware rules, when the author moves on, they, they tend to disappear from people's consciousness. The basing system for these rules is very similar to WRG, so it can be probably classed as a UK system, basing system at least. Considering this came from Australia, which tended to have fairly strong links to the UK, I suppose you could group um, together, together in, as the UK in some particular way, shape or form. Guard de Corps has gone through many different versions. We'll only look at the 2004 version, which is available as a free download and is also very complete and detailed, and I suspect the best of the three versions. Certainly better than the second version that came out in 1989. Guard de Corps 3rd edition uses the same base width for all troop types, with skirmishes being on half bases, similar to like the old WRG system. The Age of Eagles is another very good set of rules everyone should at least have a copy of and investigate. The Age of Eagles uses the US basing system for infantry, but the basing for artillery and cavalry are each different, which is unlike a set of rules such as Napoleon's battles. So in this particular case, this, was pro this set of rules really goes down the variable base width path. DBN were the first commonly available set of commercial rules which use base widths as a method of measuring a distance. As with the other DB type of rules, all bases are the same width and this used very much the UK basing system. Well, that is the history. As you can see, most rules use some form of variable base widths. Let's now discuss the potential issues with using variable base widths, starting with combat. The obvious issue is that in melee, you get different numbers of elements facing each other. Let's look at Napoleon ba Napoleon's battles in this case, which uses a variable US base width system. This shows the situation using imperial measurements. If we move to a metric country, which is the country I live in, the situation ends up being clearer, although I suspect this may not have been the game designer's intentions. This may seem like there is an imbalance here, as three infantry elements can face two cavalry elements or artillery elements, thus have a combat advantage. The cavalry may have a front line width advantage to compensate, but in terms of combat density, there was a significant difference here. On the other hand, as long as the combat values of the different troop types and elements are correctly set, this should not be an issue. It would be rare for a cavalry to break infantry in a mass, that is, if the infantry was in mass. So giving infantry the advantage in this case, on the left, is reasonable. On the right, the cavalry overlaps the infantry and thus may have an advantage as a result. Once again, this is reasonable, as cavalry would 
have been good at finding gaps and exploiting them. If we look at a three-rank French against a two-rank British situation, we can see the British can cover a greater frontage, but with less density. In a melee, uh, they would be in trouble, as there are less infantry per square metre, as can be seen on the left. On the other hand, we know two-rank fire fires almost as well as three ranks, if trained correctly, which the British were. So the British elements would have had a greater fire combat value considering the density of troops, giving them an advantage when attacked, as you can see on the right. If we go back to the old WRG rules, which are a UK variable base set of rules, we can see something similar with artillery. In this case, the artillery can achieve significant fire combat density against the charging cavalry on the left. But once the cavalry hit the artillery, it would have been its over Red Rover, because generally, once the cavalry was among the artillery, the poor old gunners wouldn't have much chance, and um, the combat values would need to reflect that. Thus, variable base widths can be mitigated, that is, the issues can be mitigated, by ensuring the elements have the correct combat value based on their width, and, of course, ensuring that they are historically viable. The next issue with variable bases does not really affect many rules, but is but it is the base but it does affect rules which use the base width measuring system. If your use rules use base widths to measure movement and fire combat, this would normally require basing to be the same width for all troop types. This is something I used to believe in until I used Napoleon Battles uh, based figures in a game which used very var used width or base width as the measuring system, and it worked really well. Of course, the issue is we need to determine what is actually the base width in the rules. Now, it's possible to ignore artillery, but if we use Napoleon, Napoleon Battle's basing system, there's probably no need to ignore artillery. You first need to identify the greatest base width of all the troop types, which is not clearly a half or double base width which can be common with skirmishes and artillery in some sets of rules. In this case, it's 3 centimetres. The other method is to use the width of the greatest number of elements, which would be 2 centimetres in this case, because there are more infantry than anything else. Thus, players could either use a 2 centimetre or 3 centimetre basing width as their measurement system. There is, of course, another factor to consider, the element depth. In this case, we need to identify the depth of the most common element, which in this case is the 3 cm infantry, um, because there are always going to be a lot more infantry uh, than any other sort of element. Also, in this particular case, the cavalry and the... Um, you could even base the artillery to have the same depth. So 3 cm is the general depth for these rules. Now, this becomes important because retreats from combat, um, typically in rules which support the element width measuring system, is normally one element width, which means that in order to clear the element's original position, it needs to be able to withdraw a distance that's at least its depth. Thus, while it's true players could use a base width of 2 centimeters in this case, uh, 3 centimeter base width is optimal. There is another factor to consider, uh, that is rules which use big bases or movement trays. Nonetheless, um, I have to admit, many players may not find this particular issue, but uh, for me, I tend to like to make sure that whatever I base is applicable for movement tray or big base rules. In this case, as long as you drop the depth of the artillery to 3 centimetres, so it becomes consistent with everything else, the elements can all neatly fit into a movement tray which allows you to use this basing system which rule with rules which use movement trays. You know, blue shoe is a good example. The issue may not be, as I indicated earlier, a major one for many gamers, as it depends on what rules they want to use. But it's always wise to use a basing system which gives you the greatest flexibility for different rules, because I can assure you, you will be using lots of different Napoleonic sets of rules. In my personal case, most of my Napoleonic figures use UK basing, which uh, basically means that um, everything is 4 centimetres wide, and the depth is 2 centimetres for infantry and 3 for cavalry and artillery. This gives me a basing system which allows me to use a host of different rules as well as movement trays. However, I'm very much commonly using a board game conversion into a figure game version set of rules, which really does suit the US basing system. It does work with the UK system if you use movement trays, but it works much nicer when using the US basing system 
So I'll be basing up a pair of force mixers which use the Napoleonic, Napoleon Battles basing system or the US system. This allows me to play a number of US sets of rules as well. Thus, in conclusion, while I still don't like variable base width, as long as all the same troop types have the same width, with some variable, variable ability allowed for, let's say, 2 rank versus 3 rank, it's possible to have different base widths for different troop types, and you can get away with it. While this issue may not be a major one for more traditional Napoleonic figure gamers, for those who like the idea of converting a Napoleonic board game into a hexless figure gaming format, this allows them to use the US basing system. If you wish to avoid movement trays, the US basing system offers significant advantages in these cases. After all, all board game counters normally are a half an inch square, which is close in shape to an infantry element, which is two centimeters wide and three centimeters deep. For those who may be interested in a possible method to determine what figures you need to purchase for a force mix, uh, this is a possible system. If you're not interested, then the video is ended. Now, this system is based on a core shown here, where the scale is about 1,000 to 2,000 men per infantry element. However, the ratios used are similar if the basic formation in your army is a division, such as if you're using a scale of, let's say, 200 to 600 men per infantry element. This basic um, manoeuvre unit, in my case core, is multiplied as many times as required. Typically you need at least four, which gives you about 50 elements per side. I normally multiply this in some cases by six, as I use a set of rules which uses reinforcements a lot, and uh, you normally need more troops in that case. In addition to the basic manoeuvre units, you do need a higher level formation. Um, you know, either army level or a core level, as um, you know, as well as including other specialty corps such as cavalry corps or other special corps like advanced corps. Starting with the highest level command, two heavy artillery elements is my advice. You know, one per pair of corps, for example. Cavalry corps varies massively. Uh, this is a possible example modelled on a rough early French cavalry corps. Special corps, such as advanced formations, also vary a lot, but normally had a high number of light infantry and more cavalry supporting it than a normal corps. Once again, this example is modelled on a Austrian advanced corps, and players would need to put some thought into it to match it with whatever nationality they're, going to, they're, they're adopting. The early Austrian equivalent also contained a lot of grenadiers. The French also used grenadier divisions prior to uh, 1812. A special formation such as that may also be an idea, as well as a guard corps. Players need to decide. If you feel four standard corps and one each of the above, as well as army support formations, you should be well covered for most rules. Let's total up all the figures so you know how much you need to buy. This shows the totals by figures. Depending on the brand, uh, the cost can vary quite a bit, but I'd expect something like this to cost about £180, possibly £200, once you include command figures and any special elements you may wish to add. At this scale, skirmishing is not a thing, so at a lower scale, you may wish to purchase some extra skirmishes to base in a skirmish format or basing system. And so we come to an end of my part 63, in this case a video on game system design covering Napoleonic basing with systems, using them as a measuring system and of course the impact of variable base widths. Algun ding, kommen zu einem Ende.